In this video, I share an interview between myself and Matt's Crypto, another very popular NFT YouTube channel, and you can see the channel here. Matt's work I've been following for several months now, and I'll link his YouTube channel and also his Twitter in the description below. The reason we wanted to do this video is so everybody could see from a founder's point of view where we feel the NFT market is going. And this was actually recorded on the 28th of April, 2022. So around two and a half months ago. So you'll get to see what our thought process was back then with regards to the market, where NFTs are going, trends we're likely to see over the next six to 12 months and beyond. If you have any questions, or any comments, please mention them in the section below. Without further ado, let's get started. So Matt, a question for you. Um, do you think we're moving into a space within the NFT market right now where we're going to get the top, let's say 1% of uh, projects actually dominating the space? So if you look at social media, and you obviously have a lot of experience in social media as well. You see things like yeah. Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, um, completely dominating. And what they did, their model, um, from what I understand, even Facebook as well, over the years, they were literally buying out any competitor along the way who seemed to be doing really well. And that with that particular competitor had a unique selling point as well. Facebook quickly, 1 billion offer, buy them out, incorporate them, and then move on from there. Do you think that will happen in the NFT space? I mean, I think you're already, you've already seen it a little bit with Yuga Labs buying CryptoPunks, right? And that was kind of one of the biggest, lead, buying one of the other biggest collections that are out there right now. And again, these are not massive, massive. I mean, they're huge in the space, but compared to every other, you know, traditional finance market, these are just, they're minnows, right? They're small. Um, so I think as, as the space progresses and you see some valuable other collections come up, sure, Yuga Labs might acquire something like a, like a Cool Cats or something like that, right? They might acquire another successful project, but you're not going to see them picking up, uh, I don't know, I can't even think of a project right now. Some, something, some products that's just flopped miserably. They're not going to start buying them up because they have to. Like this, The competition aspect, I think, is a little different in Web3 than it is in Web2. I think right now, at least, partnerships and collaboration is critical to success for a lot of projects. It's, it's, it's bolstering the value of a lot of these brands. As where Web2, it's like if you're a Facebook and your direct competitor is MySpace, for example, it's a bad example, um, you know, buying them out or buying up these, these other social media sites that are coming up and doing well is a way to eliminate competition as well as bolster your own brand. I don't know if it works the same way in Web3. We'll have to see. It's just way too early to tell right now. But I would say I'm not really worried about them like monopolizing this space. I think to your point earlier, when a big project like Yuga Labs, like Board of Yacht Club drops land or a major project, obviously a bunch of the liquidity in the NFT space moves to that project, which oftentimes sucks some of the money out of the smaller projects and medium sized projects because there's not that much money there right now. At some point that won't be the issue anymore when there's you know a lot more money in the space and it's not as not as crazy to, to, to pull 200 million to one project, right? But right now, if you pull 200 million to buy Board Ape Yacht Club land or Moonbirds, you can see these other project floors drop as a result because people have to pull that money from somewhere and there's only so many people investing in NFTs right now. I would say, uh, and, and this kind of correlates as well with like the crypto market that I've said on my channel a bunch is that when Bitcoin and Ethereum, specifically Ethereum, um, tends to fluctuate, there is some correlation. It's not it's not always net, like perfectly aligned, but there's definitely some correlation with Ethereum price and NFT, uh, you know, market sentiment, market volume. Um, so I think it's just that money being moved around, right? It's the same people in the space until this is ma way more mainstream and there's a lot more investors. This is going to be super volatile, and uh, I think you're going to see these top products continue to dominate as much as they possibly can. But I don't think it's going to necessarily monopolize the space too much. You're always going to have new products coming out. There's always going to be new products that have the potential to, to moon. And it really depends on certain things like having a docs team or having a, uh, you know, innovative new utility that no one else has really touched on yet or done well yet. Um, those are the kind of things that, that, you know, like Moonbirds came out of nowhere, in my opinion. Uh, but it's because they have a team that's, highly successful, credible, and they proved it once a couple months ago with proof. And then, you know, as soon as they launch Moodbirds, look where that's gone. I also think that another thing to keep in mind is that there's a difference between the investors investing in, you know, your, your everyday mints, like, uh, I can't even think of products right now. Like I'm thinking like the cheapest products you can come up with, right? Like a Chill Bears, for example. That investor 
is a different investor than someone who's dropping 40 ETH on a Moonbird, right? 40 ETH on a Moonbird isn't your everyday person. They're not gonna be able to, to shell out $100,000 for a pixelated owl picture. It's not gonna happen. But that money's coming from somewhere. And I think what we're seeing, especially with Moonbirds, is there's more savvy investors coming from traditional finance and, prob and probably crypto investing, and probably even some institutions that are starting to dabble with NFTs on these bigger projects that have teams that are reliable. So Kevin Rose, Ryan Carson, those guys that run Moonbirds, I believe that they have connections in, you know, in other finance areas where those people that are like, hey, I know this guy, he's doing this project, I'm gonna dabble, put in a fraction of a percent of my portfolio into a couple of Moonbirds because I have some insider information about, you know, what these guys are working on and it's a, you know, innovative new technology and a new way to invest, another way to diversify my assets. Let me invest half a million dollars in Moonbirds. And that you can, and that guy can pick them up at 40 ETH each. Yep. That's not the, that's not the majority of people right now. So I think it's kind of like a, I separate the two a lot. I separate the top 1% and, and pretty much everything else to a degree. I'd say there's a separation somewhere around the one and a half to two ETH mark. As soon as you get to that point, most people, I'd say, uh, would not be able to afford a lot of those, a lot of those NFTs on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Like spending $5,000 on something that's potentially new to you and you're not sure about it, it's definitely risky, um, is not a common thing for the majority of people, especially when you only have like a million to two million people in the space. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. It really reminds me of something funny. I saw one of our members once comment, asked me a question and he was like, um, we were announcing a new utility. He was like, can you wait about three days? Because I need to sell your pass, go do something else with the money and then come back with that same money and then buy back again. And you're, you're, you're right. It's a, it's a different type of investor and it's a tiered system. With the monopoly thing, what I'm thinking is you, you have to look at what whales are doing. And my, my worry, I don't know if it's a worry or it's a good thing for the market. It, but basically what they're going to be doing is they're only going to be investing now in projects. Let's say if they have advisors like, like you're talking about or there are massive like hedge funds and stuff in future. But they're only going to focus on a handful of projects because those have been proven with proven teams like you've said, like Moonbirds and proven track record. But also the price has been proven to hold really, really steady apart from ebbs and flows and stuff and pullbacks. But the problem with that is if they're only going to focus on those, you're not going to get the whales go anywhere near the other 95-8% of projects. So mm -hmm. that is a little bit of a worry to me because what that means is a lot of the money in the NFT space will pour more into, like Facebook, you know, uh, uh, Google, etc. All the money will be flowing more into those top 1% and pulling more away from the other 99%. And then the issue you get is some of these new projects might have some amazing ideas, but if they don't have the financing and if they can't get that from actually launching the project, where are they going to go whilst the top 1% keep innovating and they've got so much cash behind them that they can do pretty much whatever they want in the space. They can hire whoever they want in the space and then you get that little bit of a divide. I hope we're not going that way, but my worry is later this year, it does seem, if you look at ApeCoin and you look at what are board apes now, there are 150 ETH or something like that. Ridiculous floor price. My worry is we're already starting to go that way. Like you said yourself. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's somewhat inevitable that they're gonna be continuing to separate. But at the same time, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing for all projects, right? Like if you have products like Clonex and Artifact, getting acquired by Nike, it adds legitimacy to the space. So I do think overall it does help, even if they are separating even more, even if Bored Apes become worth 500 ETH per. Yes, it's unattainable for almost everyone at that point, but I do think there's gonna be things to make it more inclusive for everyone. I think there's gonna be fractionalization of NFTs at some point that, that is actually mainstream and usable. So you could buy a fraction of a Bored Ape. It does exist already, but not a lot of people do it and it's, confusing and there's definitely some loopholes that have to be fixed up but i'd say fractionalization for those uh big blue chips at that point will become a thing similar to how you can buy fractions of stocks at this point yep. like this is going to happen at some point and i do think you need those big winners those top one percent to kind of lead the charge and showcase to the mainstream what the potential is here right not every project is a rug not every project has all these these flood issues and um, scams and, and there, there is some legitimacy and some value to this as an investment vehicle and there's all kinds of other stuff with the technology that'll get discovered from that 
but you need those winners to kind of prove that. Yeah, yeah, great point. And we see that in with these massive social media companies as well. I completely agree with that. Another question I wanted to ask you, Matt, is when it comes to being a founder, so putting your founder cap on now, mm. how, how do you find it is at the moment, like maybe compared to a few weeks or a few months ago in the NFT space, like do you get pestered with a lot of questions about um, or unrealistic expectations from your project and what people expect? Are the community a lot more impatient than before or a lot more patient? How have you found it? I'm interested to hear. I would say the community is the same in terms of patience, right? Like I think people in this space are generally much more, I don't want to say impatient, but people expect things to move fast because the space moves fast, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're building tools, for example, the NFT HUD part of things, because I'm a founder of two products right now, right? I'm founder of my alpha group uh, and I'm founder of NFT HUD. For NFT HUD, the tools we're designing and building are the same development you'd be doing in any other technology, right? They're, they're, they're coding and they're building software. That process doesn't get any faster because it's in NFTs. NFTs happen to move way faster than even fast technologies like a social media or you know any other, any other software you can think of, right? The development cycle is usually, like let's think of a game for Activision. Development cycle is three years, right? And th these games are super complex. These developers work like crazy to build these games, but it still takes three years. Now we're building a platform that helps give you analytics and tools. And in a space where things move so fast, three months feels like three years. And so people kind of expect things to be, you know, they want the new tool, they want the new feature, they want this, that, and the other thing. Like there, there's a bunch of new tools coming out every single day right now. And it's because they're so valuable to investors. If you don't have a tool at this point, you're almost at a disadvantage by not having that, that access to information and, and analytics that pretty much everyone else is using to flip at this point. <laughs> So people want these updates quickly. And I would say the patience level hasn't changed. It's just that, uh, you know, you have to build at an, an incredibly fast rate and you have to deliver and execute quicker than any technology I've seen before. And I think to credit our team, we've done an exceptional job, not even me, the developers of our team have done an exceptional job of building tools that work at an incredibly fast rate with only a few people on our team. So. In that regard, I'd say yes. I mean, founders are always asking for more stuff. I think they've been rather patient uh, compared to some other products that I've seen. But at the same time, I think people tend to be upset when, they're, when their bags are down, they're gonna be more impatient. Yeah. When things are looking great and they're, you know, and the, the floor is way up and the, the tool is making them a bunch of money and everything's going flawlessly, I'm never gonna sell, never gonna sell. You know, like that's, the sentiment goes with the market. Right. It, it, that's that's kind of nature, nature of human beings in general. Like if things are great, everyone wants to buy in. If things are trash, everyone's freaking out and worrying <laughs> about selling and just covering their losses and not wanting to buy. Yep. But the truth is, like, it's the opposite that actually is the best. You want to take the profits when they're high and you want to sell. You want to buy when it's low. Like when everyone else is freaking out, that's the time you want to get in. because That's the best return. And it's no different with, with a project in NFT Founders. Like if things aren't going super well with the floor price or the overall market's down or people are pulling out money to buy other projects that are huge and your price is, you know, your floor price is dropping on your project, people start to worry a little bit. They're like, oh, maybe other people don't care about this product as much or it's not adding as much value. But generally speaking, like if you're there and you know what's going on with the project, you can tell about what the utility is. It's the same criteria you had from Mint. Does the project offer value? Is it giving me things, use cases to use it for? Am I holding it in hopes that I, you know, in a long-term approach, it's gonna make me a return on investment? Like these are the questions you ask before and during holding a project. So that's, that's kind of the sentiment. I would say, I don't think it's changed. I think people are generally just really antsy in this space because the mentality right now is, is flip and stack ETH. So yep. when you're playing that game, it's quick. You got to know what the hot project is, when to get in, when to get out, and then move on to the next one and not waste your time, you know, <laughs> riding it to the end, riding it to the ground. That's what it is for 98% of projects, I would say. The only projects where that doesn't apply is that top 1% we were talking about. Yep. If you happen to understand, you know, the space really well, put your money where your mouth is, maybe pay, a, you know, a couple thousand dollars for an Azuki early on or a, or a Cool Cat or a Clone X or whatever before it goes, you know, parabolic and nuclear. Those are the only case scenarios where I don't see people flip, rinse, repeat quickly, quickly, quickly. And we see that a lot in the alpha groups, right? Like that's almost the purpose of an alpha group, I would say right now. And that's probably why there's some bad rep here is because people are just, you know, rinse and repeating the crap out of this, out of the space just to, to stack ETH and make money. 
Um, and there's not often a lot of care or emotion for projects and staying in them. I didn't realize until recently that alpha groups had such a negative connotation outside of our communities, right? Like our mm -hmm. communities love what we do. They're in it for what we do. The, the floor prices on our projects are what they are because they're making money in these groups, right? In your group, my group, and in any other, you know, big alpha group you see out there right now, the floor prices are really good right now. And it's because the whole utility of these groups is to make money by using information in a savvy investment way. That was a weird way to say that, but the truth <laughs> is like, you're just taking information and turning it into profit is yep. really what the purpose of an alpha group is. Yep. And uh, people want to pay for that because it's going to make the money on the back end. So you have all these other projects that are coming out that don't have as clear of a return on investment or don't offer instant utility like an alpha group might. And so it's much harder to get to that consistent steady floor price as you're building a game or as you are developing your relationships in the art world or building a brand with a, another major Web2 company or whatever it is that you're trying to work on. That takes time. And so if people are impatient, of course, the floor price is going to go down. People don't want to sit around and wait. There's a lot of people that are going to be there just to make money. And if they're not making money, they're out. That doesn't mean the product's not good necessarily, but you have to be aware of all those things. I completely agree. I remember when we launched and I'm looking back thinking it was six months ago, it's only seven weeks and we're already going on to Roadmap 2.0 from 1.0, having completed pretty much everything. And I just still can't believe how fast it is. It feels like every day you're pushing. And the thing we can't control is every, if the market's down and as you've seen, a lot of stuff has tanked bad in the last few weeks, whilst generally alpha groups have held, held strong. And I think it's yep. again because of the utility but I think people are get a little bit more impatient when the general market is down, not because of the alpha group and how it's doing, but because remember, they're holding a lot of other NFTs that are down a lot. So they don't yeah. have the liquidity when it comes to trading. And the way I look at the NFT world right now is, it's like a, if you imagine a two lane highway, you're driving in one lane, there's another car next to you driving in the other. That's the general NFT market driving. And if you're behind, it's like you're always playing catch up. And what you really need to do is try and get ahead. But everything is scary how fast everything keeps moving. And then there's a Tesla in front of both of you. And in that Tesla, it's Elon Musk. And he's going to be calling the shots very soon. So I think that's going to be massive for the space as well. I don't know how it will change, but it can only be a good thing because he's trying to get rid of a lot of the issues that Twitter has already. And I like the fact that he generally likes innovation and generally he's favorable when it comes to cryptocurrency. I don't know what you think about that, Matt. Oh, dude, that's a great point. Uh, I, if you don't know, I'm a huge Elon Musk fan, was also a huge Steve Jobs fan. I'd say Elon buying Twitter is probably the best thing that could have happened for it. I'm super excited to see what he does. I wish that Discord would also pick up on the NFT and crypto space uh, you know, movement. They tried to, they tried to integrate MetaMask into Discord so you could verify through MetaMask, which they got destroyed for. <laughs> unfortunately, because that would have been absolutely massive for the space. I know that the entire NFT space runs through Discord and Twitter, so there's got to be a huge amount of people using Discord just for NFTs now. I'm hoping at some point they will catch on, but I think for Twitter, Elon owns Bitcoin. Elon owns Ethereum. Elon owns, owns Dogecoin. Hmm. I, he tweets as many shit posts as anyone else I've seen in crypto <laughs> Twitter, yeah. right? Yeah. And he gets the most engagement out of it, too. Yeah. Now the guy owns the whole platform. I can only think that things are going to be better than they were before. I can't see them getting, I, Twitter is what Twitter is, right? If you mix it even more open and free, like I don't see how that makes it any worse. Obviously there's some negative sides of that. Free speech is a two edged sword to some degree. Like there is areas where it could get messy, but I'd say overall for our space, it's a, it's a net positive for sure. I'm bullish on it. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Me too. So Matt, I just wanted to thank you for coming on to the video today. What I'm going to do in the description area below is I'm going to link uh, Matt's YouTube channel and also his Twitter account as well, where you can find more about his project and his alpha community. Thanks everyone for listening. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, guys.